Uh, PJ, good afternoon. Good afternoon indeed. Thanks for having us. Yeah, um, we we watched, Jenny and I watched um, your documentary last week. Uh, was it on RT2 or RT1? It was on RT2 last Wednesday. I yeah. think they repeated it on Saturday, I think. So somebody it, must have liked it. Really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks a million. Yeah, thanks really. for watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I think about seven people watched it. And yeah, I was just disappointed. I think the share was a bit low, but I was actually really happy with the way it turned out, to be honest. Tell people what it was about. It was about stage fright or my own struggle with stage fright because I've been doing stand-up for a long time. Uh, but as the gigs kind of got better the stage fright got worse and worse and worse uh, and it progressively got worse through the years and then I went to go back out and tour this year or just the very tail end of last year and the, the crew from RTE they sort of went uh, do you mind if we follow you I said yeah I do mind that's definitely not happening and after loads and loads of meetings I said okay it'd be grand and they do the whole we'll only watch and we won't talk to you <laughs> and we won't get in the way and we promise you'll never see us and then you realise that they will just watch but it'll be three inches from your face <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so but you get used to it and but it's, counter, it's counterintuitive because as, as you got more successful and, and you would think you would get more comfortable. You know, the more gigs you do, it's like flying hours. Yeah. But, but you actually got, you got more nervous. Yeah, it's, it's like the gambler's fallacy though. You know, you always think your next big win is coming but I always thought, well, I've gotten away with it for this long, I'm bound to have a howler soon enough, you know. I right. thought the next gig would, you always, I suppose you always feel like you're pretending to be a comedian, don't you? Like you always... Well, I'm not a comedian so I don't know but well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, pre- I'm pretending to be a broadcaster to be honest, some days, some days. <laughs> but uh, you always kind of feel like you're, like you're, I don't know, like you're going to get found out. It's mm. just a, like a fear a lot of people have. Uh, and of course it's a theory that everybody progresses to their personal level of being bad at stuff you know you, yes, you, yes, yeah, yeah. you, you just get to a fair place where you're good and then you get promoted and then you get to that point and then everybody realises you're not good enough for that yeah. position uh, talk, and, talk us through how, how bad it was uh, it was pretty bad I mean like what sort of what sort, before in the lead up now say uh, you're going on stage at 8 o'clock right I'm going right. on stage I wake up that morning and I have my breakfast and I'm already a little bit nervous and thinking to, and instead of thinking to myself about what I'm going to do with the gig I'm thinking what am I going to do how am I going to get out of it uh, how am I going to get to the venue and you know there's going to be nobody there and then whoever turns up then I start worrying about ruining people's weekends it was a big one so like say if I had a gig on a Friday I'd be thinking this is people's night out to start one night out and I'm going to ruin it on them and then you know what are they going to do you know it's going to be then they'll be talking about me they'll be hating me and then and and would, you, would you think about the fact that they, you know, they, they've had to get a taxi they've had to get a babysitter they're probably oh, going out for a meal I'd look the, at them I'd go they were in they were, I'll tell you where they were they were in Milan I was eating a pizza I'd make up <laughs> situations we had I knew everything about their lives I thought I, tell, I could tell you what they just had to drink before they came in I just thought I knew everything about them just ridiculous stuff like you know, and just uh, and you know the, thing, the weird thing is the gigs work like 99% of the time they, they work, work. Yes. the corporates don't work but you don't want them to work because yeah. to be honest it's more pleasurable ruining dinner on accountants <laughs> than, than it is actually making the gig work so, the normal gigs they work fine so there's never any reason for this panic but it is a phobia it's like that's like when you see people that are afraid of spiders and they know the spider can't hurt them and that's what makes it worse because it's just the frustration of why can't they just pick it up and throw the flipping thing out the window you yeah. know so, so the, you weren't enjoying the whole experience? I was enjoying, like I'd do the gig and I'd be on stage still like, you know, trying to settle and just remember and remember and remember. Not really enjoying it. But then just after the gig, you get a rush like, oh, I got away with it and that was brilliant. And then you start remembering it. You start going, oh, that joke worked and, and I did that and that was brilliant. Oh, and, I got, and that's when you enjoyed it. But the actual process all no. through the day okay. uh, and not being able to eat and so everything. You, you met a guy from Trinity, Von Fries or something like that. What was his, Von Fries? Yeah, the Freeze. Yeah, the Freeze. Anti-Freeze, I kept calling him. <laughs> yeah. He's terrible. Called everything except and what was name. he an expert in he's like one of these professors of stage fright that's his job I know it sounds <laughs> ridiculous but you know the way you see I don't know you see those things like a hurricane hitting the states and go this guy is a professor of how caravans fly in tornadoes and yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. not a job but there yeah. is they actually all have these jobs and, and he just deals with people with stage fright and he, <laughs> he had a funny approach to it like the first time he came to see me Jenny was talking to me about it earlier today he sat like right beside me I was on stage and he was like within he was five feet just looking at me and it kind of made me freak out a little bit more but he helped me calm down and just realise you know a bad gig if it comes it's just a bad gig I mean mm. at worst it's a story for the next gig yes, so it's yes. fine yeah, you know yeah, yeah. and then I went to the NLP guy uh, Brian who you know well yeah and, we've had him on a good few times yeah and I was really really sceptical I was like this is not going to just work. for people it's, it's <laughs> neuro linguistic programming yeah ne- neuro linguistic so, so the idea is he said I don't know how he does it but he says he reprograms the brain yeah yeah. and I know I th- and this is the thing that sounds 
ridiculous right it doesn't make any sense and I was literally walking into her house going this is the stupidest thing I've ever done and an hour later I left feeling brilliant but I suppose if anyone tells you you're brilliant for an hour you're going to feel better and that's what he did he told you you were brilliant for an hour he plays a little bit of music and he makes you close your eyes and then he spent about and that was the mad thing about it he spent about an hour going just stop asking yourself negative questions don't think what's the worst that can happen think what's the best that can happen so he starts there and then he goes to think about conquering the world think about you can do anything imagine anything you've ever wanted to do and think about doing it and he goes now think bigger imagine yourself as the president of the United States you know always think big and you can do anything I don't want do to be the president of the United States you yeah, don't say just, that to him no. <laughs> no really he's just like think as big as you can and you can do anything and then I was all excited after it and I went oh my god can I go to the toilet and he went ah, no actually I don't have the key my wife went out the key so immediately <laughs> it was like the first thing I couldn't do was just go for a wee but it was kind of <laughs> so you come down to where it's fairly fast but if you do it repetitively it actually starts to work and you okay. do build your confidence up and then the first gig after that was in on Green Arm was it in, in, in Letterkenny uh, yeah in Letterkenny yeah. and it was like a light switch honestly it was like a light switch Like I got there and I was standing looking at the audience and I, there, normally I wouldn't be able to look at them. I'd have to just sit with my head in my hands and start really panicking. I was just watching it all happen. It just felt so strange. Like, just that it was like this light switch moment where I wasn't... And I got nervous because I wasn't nervous. Right. Which is a ludicrous... Because, <laughs> again, looking for the worst case scenario. <laughs> and went out and the gig was fine. And it's never come back, like, ever since. It's never been as bad as it used to be, ever since. You know that, you know, in, in the list of fears that people have, public yeah. speaking is up there. You know, up the top up yeah. the top well Jerry Seinfeld says that the two top fears when they surveyed two people's top fears number one was public speaking and number two was death right so he was saying that if you go to a funeral you'd rather be the person in the coffin than the guy <laughs> doing the ceremony like, so it's got <laughs> but, but it is irrational like, we met people doing it that weren't in it though that like had turned down job promotions because they were afraid they'd have to do you know a presentation once yeah. a month and it's just, just all, all over just standing there talking to people. It seems terrifying. It's terrifying to most of us and I don't really know why. Now that I'm on this side, I can't remember why. Yeah, because <laughs> no harm can come to you. I think that's the thing. Like, I'd yeah. be fearful of something that could harm me. I know, yeah. And that's the thing, I raced motorbikes for a long time and never had a problem with it. And, like, if you die on stage, you just go to the dressing room and eat yeah, sweets. Yeah, it's, it's figure of speech, let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just not, figure It's not speech. Tommy Cooper. No, yeah. no, no. But, you know, the term is always, if you have a bad gig, yeah, oh, he yeah, died. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just sit in the dressing room, eat sweets and wait till you, everyone You'll be home. on stage tonight in Dolan's in Limerick. Yeah, I'm on in Dolan's tonight in Limerick, yeah. Thanks for coming into us. Yeah, well, you, what, are you going, you're going to hit the traffic now, aren't you? What, what, what time are you I going? Just, no, you're half four. I'll miss it. You'll miss it, Yeah, right. I'm missing the, I'm meeting the two support acts here and then we'll just we'll spin off from there. Okay, and then Vicar Street, the 28th of March and the 17th of April. Yeah. And I, I think that I was, I think that I sort of happened upon with you. And I, I, I know you've told the story before, but I want to te- you to tell it again because you're adopted. <laughs> I am adopted. Yeah. yeah, and we, I sort of happened upon it, did I? Or uh, we were, I was just chatting away I, to you, and you just said, "Oh, I'm adopted." I know. And then you had me in two weeks later and <laughs> asked me everything. You know, yeah. <laughs> tell me everything. Yeah. Where were you born? In Bespra House. I was born in Bespra House in Cork. Uh, I don't remember it now. No. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I was, yeah, so yeah, 1975 I was born there. Right. And so, so, like, because that's one of the, 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 the mother and baby homes, isn't it? Best yeah, friend. well, yeah, it's one of the ones I didn't actually know much about it, to be honest, until all the scandal came out like right. last year. So I was like watching it for like, it's just so, so unusual because I obviously have no memory of it and I didn't know any of these stories. And then they start coming out everywhere going, this is insane stuff. Like it was just so much about your past you just don't even know about. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, but, you, but your uh, adoptive parents, they told you from as, as oh, soon I always as you... Knew. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I always knew. I remember finding out that other people weren't and I was baffled by it. I, <laughs> I thought you just, your parents had kids and they gave them to your real parents. That's what I thought. And then when I remember thinking, I remember talking to a guy in school, really young, one of my earliest memories and him saying, no, no, my parents are my parents. And I thought, what a weirdo. <laughs> I was like, obviously nobody wanted this kid. <laughs> this kid wasn't wanted by anybody. It was just so weird, Joe. When you know all the time, it's just normal to you. Yeah. Uh, and and they were lovely. Uh, Sean and Helen. And uh, Sean died in 1999. And I, I, I think it's, it's, it's odd um, with parents and being proud and all that sort of thing. You would have loved Sean to see you, you know, been successful. Yeah, because unfortunately he died when I was in drama school. So, right. yeah, so he never saw any of us, uh, which is a shame. It's a, it's a shame. It's one thing that if I had a chance to go back and if there's one thing I could change... You know, yeah. I'd have him die ten years later. Yeah. You know, and see you as the whistler. Or just, yeah, 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 just so we know things are going to be okay. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Because yeah. your dad always just wants everyone to be all right. You know, and he wasn't the best communicator. Like you know, we lying in bed and just come in and go, oh, you're all right, yeah, Grant, yeah, okay. Throw <laughs> smoke out the window and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> My so, dad's wearing the eighties. <laughs> so it was all about you then. You went in search of your your biological parents. I did. did yeah, yeah, yeah. I went in the search. Was, what age were you? Uh, it was two thousand two. 
2002, right. yeah. What so age were you? I was, <laughs> what, what age am I now? Well, 2015, I'm 40 in April. Right. So was I, what, 27-ish? Right. Is that right? I can't do yeah, sums. Right, right. I'm it's, terrible at sums. It's 30, yeah, about 27, yeah. Yes, right. See, now I've been found out about yeah. something. <laughs> yes, I was around that age. But you're 40, it's coming. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, know, you look good on it. Uh, for 40? Yeah, yeah. Do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't believe I'm 40. I feel like a 16-year-old with really bad knees. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel like. I don't feel like an adult. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, when people say you're going to have kids, me and Elaine, we're like, what, what are you talking about? Where would we put them? They just haven't dressed up as jockeys riding the dogs around the house. So I wouldn't be able for a kid. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't, have, wouldn't know what to do. So, so you went, uh, and how does that go? You go to the adoption board, do you? And you write a letter and you send off the letter and then yeah. you wait for a response and then hopefully the response comes back. It's just a waiting game. It's a sort of a long process and then eventually then you meet up and say, how are you doing? And hope for the best. You know, it's Go kind on, of talk it's us a big through adventure. That. Talk us through well, that. I went, I sent the letter and uh, then I got another letter back saying, yeah, we're, we have, we want to meet up. And then I found out I had two brothers and two sisters and they got married to two of them. Uh, so it was kind of like, so, but, I was the black sheep uh, coming so, back to see the rest oh, of them. Hold on, your biological parents got married yeah. and then went on to have children. And they went on and had uh, t- four more kids. Yeah. Right. Two and brothers they're, and two they're sisters. full brothers and sisters. Brothers and four, yeah, and one of them's the same first name as me. So imagine two older brothers in the same family with the exact same first name. <laughs> It's gas, isn't it? Like, but, <laughs> you just couldn't make that up. But who gave you, who gave you your name? Your adopted... Your oh, yeah, well, you say, like, my... I was... Your, your, your biological mother gave you a name in... in yeah, I had a different name. Oh, yeah. But then, obviously, my name changed when I met my parents. Yes, yeah. I mean, but by coincidence... It's so confusing, isn't it? But like, by coincidence, then, your biological parents gave what, their other sons the same next, name. Yeah, yeah. So there's two older brothers, right. if, you think, if you think about it that way. Both the same name. Yes. You don't meet each other and go, hey, oh, yeah. I'm oh, the you? older brother. Yes, yeah, so am I. <laughs> I'm Patrick. Yes, yeah, so am I. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Very, like it's just unusual. The whole thing is very unusual. What a great thing to do! Great thing to do. But thirteen years on, what do you see them regularly? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, like I mean, they're family, you know. Yeah, uh, and it works. Like it's, it's just there's no guidebook because you know where everyone else in your family sits, you know. So I know where my aunties and uncles. I know their job. You, you know, they come around once a year and then we ignore each other for three hundred sixty-four <laughs> days. So now it works fine. Uh, we tolerate each other. <laughs> and then your immediate family, you know how that works. And then there's the. The, this when you have this adoption uh, thing it's a grey area you've got to find out in your feet and take it slow yeah yeah. did so they go to the gigs uh, they've been to a few in the early days <laughs> no one's been to me new show yet. <laughs> maybe it'll be in get Victor Street together. who knows get your act together uh, you're in Dolan's tonight as I say and then Victor Street 28th of March and the 17th of April and if you haven't seen um PJ's documentary on stage fright. It's up there on the RTE player. PJ, thanks for me for coming in and safe on the road.